folks who are going to join us. But can anyone guess what these three elements have in common? They cause pain. They do cause pain. Hot flashes, hemorrhoids, and headaches all cause pain. What are else do we have? Oh, I don't know. Are they related to low magnesium? They're related to low magnesium. That's right. Those are three oh, very... Since we're on the subject. Since we're on the subject, yeah. yeah. Those are three common symptoms when you have poor status, magnesium status. So we're going to talk about... Is that true even in menopause? Yep, absolutely. Even more so in menopause. Because I don't know, I haven't had a hot flash in, oh, I don't know, 30 years? <laughs> yeah. Well, they, you, clearly they will subside, mm -hmm. but as you go through transition, that's when it really flares up. But we'll talk a little bit more about that. So we are going to talk about magnesium. Uh, Liz and I have taken a, a major dive in the last six weeks into this lovely mineral. Um, I've now read six books and about 50 articles on it. Now, the, the, what's entertaining about this is that behind all cravings and obsessions is a magnesium deficiency. So I have an obsession with magnesium now. It just, it just, I, I, can't, I can't get enough of it, and it just keeps it. Yeah. So we're going to share what we've learned in, in the last few weeks, and uh, look forward to all your questions and, and comments. You've all received a, a page of quotations. I took the, the first one off, which I think is particularly important. Uh, Jay Cohen uh, is a physician who practices up in New York. He wrote a little little booklet called the Magnesium Solution for High Blood Pressure. <clears throat> and it's just a simple little monograph, but it absolutely puts the medical community on its ear because it's mm -hmm. the exact opposite of what people think high blood pressure is. And when you have magnesium deficiency, what happens is your sodium levels rise and your potassium, potassium drops. And as anyone knows, High blood pressure is a, is, the func is a byproduct of an imbalance between sodium and potassium. And so what do they have you do? Stop eating salt. It's the worst thing they could have you do. Because magnesium is in fact what controls the electrolytes in your body. And so when the magnesium drops, the body just starts going crazy, trying to, it creates pressure yes. to retrieve those minerals. That's why the pressure is going up. It, it's doing it for a reason. So they never think to ask, why is this doing this? They just react and suddenly put you on a yeah. diuretic. Yes. Anyone here on yeah. diuretics? Okay. Well, the, the interesting thing about that is when you were put on a diuretic to deal with hypertension, is it forces more magnesium out of your body, which only makes your high blood pressure even higher. Yeah. So you, you can't win that. You can't, can't win that battle. In any event, his point I think is very valid. It's it's actually very distressing to know how few people, especially people within the medical community, know about magnesium. Mm -hmm. It's a very well guarded uh, issue, and we'll talk more about that. So, if you've ever seen any films of the early photography that was done, like during the Civil War, and they'd have that big boom, yeah. that was magnesium that they were using to light the the room or the, the scene for the photograph. Hmm. It's a it's a very explosive uh, element. Uh, it's in the periodic table. It's item. It's element number twelve, and it's a one of the four key electrolytes in the body: sodium, potassium, magnesium, and um, calcium. Calcium. Thank you. And what? Uh, calcium. Calcium. Oh. calcium. <clears throat> so we're going to talk a little bit more about the lamp of life. It's when you begin to really study this mineral, it's almost it's very humbling to realize what it does inside the body. But in particular, it's responsible for thousands of biochemical processes because it really is a key component of a lot of the enzymes that run your body. If you don't have magnesium, you don't have have enzyme activity, um, and the most important of which is around energy production and ATP. 
the most magnetic attraction in the, in the human body is between magne magnesium and ATP. What is ATP? ATP is adenosine triphosphate, and that is the very substance that creates energy in your body. AT ATP has three phosphorus molecules, and when it gets paired up with magnesium, one of those phosphorus molecules pulls away, and there's an explosion, and it's magnesium that makes that happen. And that explosion is the energy that runs your cells, all 100 trillion of them. So when you begin to feel fatigue, tired, listless, that's very often it's a magnesium deficiency that's behind that. Um, magnesium is also critical in the development of RNA, which then becomes DNA and vice versa. Um, the, the, very, the very process that drives your body and the, the development of, of protein synthesis is driven by magnesium. And then key to all mineral balance is magnesium. It's what controls the levels particularly of potassium and sodium uh, and calcium. Now, you may, you, I'm sure you've heard of chlorophyll. Um, it's, it's what makes plants green. Well, at the center of, of a chlorophyll plant is magnesium, and it's bound to four nitrogen atoms. And it is this mineral that's able to convert solar energy into food energy. That's how important it is. It is the absolute essence of life. So it's, when you begin to understand the magnitude of its importance, it's very curious, why don't more people know about this? So what we're going to do is just uh, spend a few minutes talking about who is magnesium deficient, why are we deficient, what are the signs of deficiency, what's the science, and what are some options for how you can get it into your body. So who is magnesium deficient? <laughs> Almost everybody. Yeah. Um, there are various surveys, but, but anywhere from 78 to 90 percent of the population is considered magnesium deficient, especially if you're over the age of 55. It goes up exponentially over the age of 55. Women pass on their deficiencies to their children. Unfortunately, it happens. Uh, is that when they're pregnant or when they're breastfeeding? Or? Well. What's happening more and more is that women in the third trimester of their pregnancy are living off the adrenals of their children. And the adrenal glands and magnesium are very much interrelated. And so these children are being born down a step. And, and they are facing all sorts of food allergies and all sorts of, of related issues. Well, it's because their adrenal glands are completely wasted. Um, there are some folks who say that it takes three generations to correct this. We don't agree with that, but there is a, a, a belief that it takes a long time for this to come about. Uh, people who exercise and people who don't exercise are deficient. But the reason why people who exercise are a problem is that when you sweat, you're, you're letting out a lot of not just sodium and potassium, but magnesium. And what do the, the more popular sport drinks have? What they do is they have a lot of potassium in them, but no magnesium. And in fact, it takes magnesium to hold on to the potassium. If you don't have magnesium, you're not going to hold on to the potassium that you're getting back into your body. So uh, a lot of the sports drinks are, are really not, not worth the money that people are spending. As I mentioned, the, uh, the older adults have a, have a key issue with this. Anyone on medication, there are 14 different classes of medication <clears throat> that drain your body of magnesium. Any high blood pressure medication, any cardiac medication, um, hormone replacement therapy, um, a lot of antibiotics drain the body of magnesium. Uh, and they do it for a reason, there's, a, there's intent behind it, but there's a wicked backside, and the backside is you're losing magnesium. And I would then, guess your medications for um, 
depression if they would that be included in that. And some of them are, absolutely. Yeah. And um, one of the things I forgot to mention is that we have a, a really nice monograph that's brought to our attention by one of the suppliers that we work with. And we're going to email it to, to everyone who, who comes tonight. We're also going to post it on our website. But it's called Magnesium, America's Lost Mineral. And it's 10 pages of really solid information, very well researched. And I think your draws will draw when you begin to read how it's involved in so many different conditions. Um, OK. And then anyone consuming the standard American diet, especially as found in the building next door. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, this is from a um, study that was done about the magnesium trace elements. This was done in 1997. And they went back historically and looked at the diet at the turn of the century and began to evaluate how the amount of magnesium began to drop. And we have a high of 475 to 500 milligrams per day. And then when this study was done um, in 1997, it was it dropped into the low 200s. What's particularly noteworthy, though, is that in 1964, uh, Mildred Seelig, who was a world-renowned magnes magnesium expert, declared a deficiency of magnesium is dangerous for the nerves, heart, and kidneys. At that time, she declared magnesium deficiency a severe health crisis in America. And that was almost 50 years ago. So we've now gone through two generations since she brought, brought that to our attention. Trust me, it's not gotten any, more, any better. Um, so when she did the study, the magnesium levels were in the low 300s. And now it, it's anyone's guess as to where they are. When you think about how important it is, it really begins to uh, clarify why are so many people struggling with so many chronic illnesses, the heart disease, the diabetes, the migraines, the fibromyalgia. All of these chronic diseases that appear to be completely unrelated all have a common pathway. It's magnesium deficiency. And what drains magnesium from your body is stress, any kind of stress. So you ask, well, where's the stress in our lives? Well, lack of sleep. We don't sleep as a, society, as a society anymore. All sorts of mental and emotional stress. Can you imagine the magnesium levels in Washington, D.C.? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Especially with the 450 clowns running the country. <laughs> um, food allergies are a particular source of stress. But just our entire food system is deficient in magnesium. All sorts of immune challenges, whether they be bacterial, viral, fungal, heavy metals, um, environmental chemicals, the pesticides that are used, uh, our typical diet, and then another source that's becoming very, very prevalent, mold and other toxins. The, the irony is magnesium becomes depleted as a result of, this, of these stressors, but it's magnesium that enables your body to fight off of these, fight off these stressors. I mean, we were, we were meant to have stress in our lives, whether it was a saber-toothed tiger or a traffic jam or whatever it happens to be today. But when you don't have enough magnesium, Everything is a major stressor, and your body goes on to red alert, and your adrenal glands are always firing. And so you have people who have severe food allergies, and just looking at certain foods will make some people react, as, mm -hmm. as you all know, Joyce. Um, and, and there are situations where the slightest provocation will cause someone to really lose it. Um, there are people having altercations now over the slightest little issue, and it's being well recorded in the journals of police enforcement and, and issues of that, or periodicals that, that track that. People are getting more and more reactive to the slightest thing. That's a magnesium deficiency. Is that a chemical road rage? 
Yeah. Road rage, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, why are we deficient? Well, these are the four major stressors that we're going to take a look at. Um, the biggest source is that we're not sufficiently hydrated with mag magnesium rich water. Hard water has calcium and magnesium in it. And there was a time when a lot of water had that. Well, a lot of municipalities like to soften the water because people don't like the taste of hard water. So they've, they've methodically taken magnesium out of the water. We have the nutritional imbalances that I'm sure you're all familiar with. But sugar in particular is very hard on the body. But what it does is it causes a release of adrenaline. And when adrenaline is released, sodium goes straight up and magnesium goes straight down. And so even though it tastes great, it's very hard on your body. It has a very wicked impact on your body. Processed foods have methodically taken magnesium out. Whole grains have magnesium, as we'll see in a few minutes, but processed foods where they've refined the, the wheat or refined other products, they've taken up upwards of 80% of the magnesium out of the product. Uh, or they've, we don't have sufficient nutrients. And then, of course, the other challenge we've got in today's diet is everything has calcium. For, for millennia, we lived in an environment that was magnesium rich and calcium poor. And the human body is designed to hold on to calcium at all costs and to let go of magnesium at any, at any point because it knew that there was magnesium everywhere in our environment until the last hundred years. In the last hundred years, it has flipped. And we now have a calcium-rich environment and a magnesium-deficient situation. And so now the body can't get the magnesium. It's holding on to all this calcium. And then suddenly you have cataracts. Well, that's calcification. Um, multiple sclerosis. That's calcification of the brain. Arthritis, calcification of the joints. Kidney stones, calcification of your kidneys, or gallstones, and it goes on. I have, I have uh, calcification in my heart arteries. I thank my, my mother and grandmother and my great-grandfather for that. But that's where the stress resides in our family, and so it's, it's calcification, because we have this backwards environment now. <clears throat> and the, the soils no longer have magnesium in it, unless they are properly uh, reinforced with bone meal, which very few farmers are going to use except for organic farmers, and then the use of synthetic vitamins and supplements further challenge the situation, and then of course as we talked about, prescription and over-the-counter drugs. The excess need, oversupply, and the excess supply of junk food over need, and then of course we have all the chemicals in our, in our diet, the alcohol, tobacco, and the food additives. Alcohol, major drain, and magnesium, tobacco, major drain in magnesium, and food additives. Um, and then these are some of the more challenging food additives that, that we deal with. And then carbonated soft drinks, uh, particularly the ones that have phosphate, which is most carbonated drinks. Uh, even though they say carbonated, it's actually phosphates, that the phosphoric acid that they're using. Phosphorus drains the body from magnesium does it very, very efficiently. Physical trauma, childbirth, which we talked about, um, but again, multiple pregnancies, mm -hmm. accidents, burns. Burns are probably the, the most traumatic physical event that would traumatize your magnesium bag. Um, hemorrhaging, surgery, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, and insomnia. Anyone or any of, any of the folks that you know who might have had uh, chemotherapy or radiation therapy, absolutely guaranteed they are completely wiped out of their magnesium. Mm -hmm. yeah. Environmental stressors, exhausting exercise. I, I, I marvel at, I, I picked up um, endurance sports when I was 50 years old, did it for five years. I don't know how I survived it, but I did. Ran several marathons, did a triathlon, and I just knew that at the end of a long run, I was absolutely wiped. 
Well, now I know why. Because I was taking sports drinks that weren't replenishing my magnesium stores. Um, so it's a miracle that I'm here. Um, but we've got pollution, it's just the smoke that's in the air, flashing lights, all these are very uh, destructive to the, the magnesium levels in the body. And then, of course, psychological stress. Um, there is an individual that you probably don't know about, but you probably have relied on his product. It's called zinc lozenges. Zinc lozenges were invented by a guy by the name of George Eby. He lives down in Texas. Dripping Springs, Texas, which is not too far from Dallas. And George Eby is a very um, innovative scientist, and, but he's also battles depression. And from 1987 until the year 2000, he took Zoloft for his depression. And then one day, it stopped working like that, that fast. And he started going into a deep depression, which terrified him, as you can imagine. But he was able to do some research and discovered that, lo and behold, in 1921, they made a definitive link between depression and magnesium. And it had become very successfully buried in the annals of, of medical journals. And he undertook a, what's called a review article in 2007 and unearthed the hundreds and hundreds of articles that have been written about this very subject before the advent of all the um, SSRIs. And he went so far as to compile all this information, made a DVD of all this information that he had compiled with all these articles and sent a copy to every member of Congress with a very extensive cover letter explaining to them why the, if they were really serious about trying to deal with health care costs, this would be a good place to start. Out of the was it, 545 people that he sent the letter to, guess how many people contacted him and thanked him for that information? Ten. Yeah. Any other guesses? Zero. Not one person. So, so psychological stress. Any kind of psychological stress is on a spectrum of magnesium deficiency. And the most severe is suicide. And anyone who has not been successful in committing suicide gets a blood test, and lo and behold, guess what they find out? Oh, they're really deficient in magnesium. And then they act surprised. So. But how many doctors would be looking for that? And that's the question to ask. And so, so what we're going to do is run a campaign now, and we're going to ask, how is your doctor treating your depression? And then we're going to give them three citations for magnesium deficiency. We're going to say, how's your doctor treating your magnesium deficiency that's behind your diabetes? We'll give them three magnesium citations. What? How is your doctor treating your cardiac disease and the magnesium deficiency that's behind it? And then three citations. Because the information's there. I am stunned at how many articles. It, I was telling Liz just the other day, it's like shooting fish in a barrel. I go to Google. I just pick a disease at random, and then I put the word magnesium next to it, and what pops up? A thousand articles. This has been very well studied. But Why isn't it out there? Because, because it's very simple, good, good question. It's not out there because this is a natural solution that cannot be... So it's a pharmaceutical You, you cannot patent magnesium. Right. It's a natural substance. Ah. And so what they've done is they have manufactured very intricate chemicals that mirror what magnesium does, yes. but at the same time drain the body of the very substance that they're trying to mimic. Right. It, it makes no sense at all. So I have a question. Yeah. Now, what about, um, so if you go to the doctor and you get a test for magnesium to see what your levels are, what would that be? We're going to talk, okay. talk about that. Okay. It, there's a part of this that will absolutely drive you crazy because no one knows about this. Mm -hmm. There is no good yardstick to measure it. No. There are a couple that are, that are worthwhile. And then the other conundrum is what's the best way to rehydrate the body with magnesium? Mm -hmm. And we are, 
chasing all three of those issues with a vengeance because everyone's just, just a, everyone's mystified by this. Again, this is probably the most important mineral in our body. It's you know it's very important, but there is there is no thermometer. There's no tire pressure gauge that we can touch your body with and say, wow, you really do have it, except there are a couple that we think are, are worth noting. But the blood tests you get, you know, when they go through all the... The, the problem with the blood test things. is that 99% of the magnesium in your body, actually more than that, it's 99.7% of the magnesium in your body is either in your bones or soft tissue. Less than three-tenths of 1% is, is in your blood. Mm -hmm. And so when they're measuring the blood, the body is very efficient at making sure that I need that three-tenths of one percent magnesium there. And so it's always going to be within some level of tolerance. So it's not going to show up in the blood like it does with some other, mm -hmm. other uh, minerals. Again, it's just one of, the, one of the quirks of the body. So why are we deficient? Again, it's reduced intake, impaired absorption, and increased excretion. And we'll talk a little bit more about, about that. So, just to close out this section, probably the, one of the greatest stressors in the body is our thinking. And there's a, a uh, Japanese uh, physicist who studied this. He wrote a book called The Messages from Water. And what he did was he took pictures of frozen water. But and what he did was tape different messages on the water that they were contained in. And this is what I can do, it looks like, and this is what I can't do, it looks like. So it's just, given that we are over 80% water, we are constantly in a position to potentially drain ourselves of our magnesium. So it's just, the thoughts and emotions do affect the physical uh, properties of the world that we live in. What are signs of magnesium deficiency? Uh, tight spastic muscles, twitches, um, unstable blood sugar. All these people running around saying, I'm, I'm hypoglycemic, so I'll have another whatever. No, it's just they're magnesium deficient. And they don't have enough fat in their diet. That would be the second thing. The cramps in your legs. Absolutely. Muscle twitches. Absolutely. Um, seizures and tremors. Cardiac rhythm problems high blood pressure, which we talked about, TIAs, which is a small stroke, headaches, anxiety, depression, alcoholism, and then any craving and addictions. Behind any craving and addiction is a magnesium deficiency. So uh, I think you all have the survey uh, and encourage you to fill it out. Whoever gets the highest score gets a free nutritional assessment so be sure to fill that out and turn it in um, but one of the one of the sources websites that we like is this ancient minerals uh, and they have a, an interesting assessment here it just has 10 questions we won't go through them because many of them are in your survey but but basically you can see many of these issues are very much a part of our day-to-day -day life when you think about the beverages and the things that we eat coffee, tea, or other caffeinated drinks. We don't think about the impact that that's having on our magnesium standards. Mm -hmm. Taking different medications, drinking more than seven uh, alcohol drinks a week, um, taking calcium supplements without magnesium. That's a really serious issue because it really puts a, a tremendous strain. Calcium and magnesium are a seesaw. When one goes up, the body is forced to drain the other. So as the calcium status goes up, Magnesium is going to come down. Or as magnesium drops, calcium is going to rise. Why? Because the body needs those electrons to run. It's the only way it knows how to work. It's, it's, it's absolutely dependent on those electrons. And then again, as you said, muscle, muscle spasms, cramps, fibromyalgia, facial tics, and eye twitches. And then, of course, if you're over 55. Uh, practitioners deal with it with poor nutrition, all sorts of uh, nasal and bronchial issues, uh, acidity throughout the body, and then having constipation is a, is a, a classic sign of uh, magnesium deficiency. 
And then this chart here was actually developed by that Dr. George Eby that I mentioned before. Um, this is the swirling series of issues that he identified um, that was critical in connecting it back to magnesium deficiency. As you can see, the, the end game here is suicide. And this is from a, from a behavioral standpoint. But it, it's a little striking, but even something as significant as autism or early Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, are all considered a function of magnesium deficiency. Migraine headaches. The, the studies that have been done about migraine are striking, and invariably upwards of 80 to 90 percent of the people who take magnesium supplements, their migraines go away. Completely go away within a matter of hours. So uh, there's, there's a lot of substance and a lot of, of rich research that's been done around you know, these, these symptoms that are listed here. Uh, conditions that are helped with magnesium, it's sort of a, a who's who of conditions uh, that you can see. Anxiety. This is the fascinating part. Cholesterol. Well, think about it. There's a reason why the body produces cholesterol. It's because you're under stress. You need, you need that cholesterol in order to make stress hormones. That's how the body works. And the most amazing thing is magnesium is a break for cholesterol. When there's enough magnesium in the body, you're not stressed out. So you don't need the hormones. And it's, it's even more insidious is that you can't convert LDL cholesterol, the so-called bad cholesterol, into HDL cholesterol, unless you have what, mi what mineral do you need in order to convert LDL to HDL? Magnesium. Magnesium. And so it's a double whammy. Mm -hmm. And HDL is a really important component because that's the lipoprotein that brings all the stuff back to the liver. Uh, diabetes, absolutely linked to magnesium deficiency. Uh, what's amazing about this is you look through these different conditions, some of them are minor, some of them are major. It's fascinating how the human body expresses itself with the same condition. But it has to do with where stress patterns are established in your body, where they were established in your family, like in my family where it's in the heart. Some people it's in their kidneys, some people it's in their joints, some people it's in their brains. We have a client who has multiple sclerosis. She's very worried about this. We were talking about this particular topic and I said, has there been any kind of brain issues in your family in the past? And like that she said, well, my grandfather had 19 strokes before he died. Do you think that would have an impact on how that tissue might have gotten passed down through the generations? You know, it, it's just it's amazing how it gets manifested um, and, and what we go through to try to accommodate it. But you can see all these different conditions have a significant factor in um, magnesium deficiency. So think about it. When there's an, an issue around trying to come up with some kind of natural anti-spasmodic issue, to magnesium. What they now speculate is that a lot of the women who are having trouble conceiving is because the, the, the ovaries are under spasm because there's not enough magnesium in the body. Um, and the list just goes on and on. Why do we have heart attacks? Because the very tissue down at the very at the cellular level of the, of the cardiac muscle can't relax because there's too much calcium there, forcing it to fire, and it, it reaches a point where it just stops. Because there's no magnesium to allow it to relax. And that's what causes a heart attack. In addition to a number of other factors which we won't go into today. And a key function of magnesium is to regulate the nerves. Absolutely essential. Again, but it's all in balance. 
It's not to say that all calcium is bad, it's just it's the balance of calcium to magnesium. And what's happened is where it's supposed to be like this, it has become like this. And cal we are over calcified and under magnesiumized, whatever that means. Um, negative passions, hatred, temper outbursts, jealousy, quarrels, resentment, bitterness, they're all about magnesium. And Dr. Norm Shealy, um, he is a uh, research physician down in Texas. Uh, he has probably studied this substance as much as, as a handful of others, but he is adamant about, in his opinion, with the exception of people who have kidney disease, which is a very small percentage of the population, I think it's less than three-tenths of one percent, there's no illness that is not helped significantly by magnesium. So what's the science? We'll take a look at this. Human body is made of 100 trillion cells. It's supposed to have a specific shape and gap between them. Guess what? Make sure that shape and gap is just right. Magnesium. Uh, each of those cells has the ability to communicate. If they're not the right shape and gap, they can't communicate. And each of those cells creates energy in an organelle called the mitochondria. It's where the magnesium is stored in your body along with the ATP, and again, when they, when they break apart, it does in fact create the lamp of life. Everyone knows about calcium. We have 100 grams, that's a lot, it's several pounds of, of, of calcium in our body, you would hope so, because that's what's running our, our skeletal system. It's the most abundant mineral. 99% of the calcium is in our bones. 99% in our bones and our teeth. 1% is supposed to be in our tissue. 10 grams reside in the soft tissue. It's the catalyst that sparks movement and reaction in the soft tissue. So what makes your muscles contract is calcium. And it outweighs magnesium in the body by 10 to 1. The average body contains only 90 grams of magnesium. It's the fourth most abundant mineral, but 60% is found in the bones. 36 grams reside in the soft tissue. So you can see there's a significant difference in the soft tissue. It's responsible for relaxation and it outweighs calcium in the soft tissue more than 3 to 1. So it begs the question, why are we taking calcium in a 2 to 1 ratio? It doesn't make sense. So this gets to the point that you're raising. My blood levels are fine. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure they are. I'd be shocked. If, if they weren't, you wouldn't be here right now. <clears throat> but these are the scientists that have gone on record. Dr. Seeley, Dr. Dean, Dr. Sheely, Dr. Resnick, Dr. Circus, Dr. Blalock, and J.R. Rodell. Some of you have probably heard of Rodell Press. Yes. Uh, J.R. Rodell wrote a book in 1968 about magnesium and how important it is. It's a fascinating book to read, particularly looking back now over 45 years, and what they knew then and what we haven't done today. But the fact of the matter is, um, because of the way the blood is structured, it's a waste of time to look for magnesium deficiency in the blood. Magnesium loading is a, it's a urine test that you can take. It's, it's very cumbersome to do. It's a little bit challenging for the client. It's very accurate, but it's not the most popular because it takes 24 hours of collection and oh, yeah. it's a lot of, lot of moving parts in that. And there's something called intracellular spectroscopy, but this is only for the research labs. There are only a handful of labs in the country that can do this. It's very, um, a very expensive procedure, but it's actually very accurate. And then the last, which we tend to, to use here, but it's completely disregarded in the uh, conventional medical circles is hair tissue mineral analysis. And my personal theory why is because it's a very inexpensive test that began to reveal back in the 70s and 80s just how magnesium deficient people were. And there was a very or well orchestrated campaign by the AMA to try to discredit the, the test. And, and they were very successful in, in doing so. But again, less than 1% is in the blood. It's actually 
three tenths of one percent. In in the American medical circles, it's called less than one percent. When you go to the UK, they get very specific. It's three tenths of one percent. Now there are two forms of magnesium deficiency, and again this comes out in the um, hair analysis that we do. You have what's called an absolute magnesium deficiency, which means you the one is considered that's the reference range. It's six millimoles per liter of um, in your, your body, and when it's below six, or in this case, one is the reference range. One that for magnesium, one is six. I, I'm sorry for confusing you this way, but in any event, an absolute level is the magnesium is well below its normal level. And that's an absolute magnesium deficiency. The other form is what's called a relative magnesium deficiency, and that's when there is so much calcium, which is what this is what we tend to see in about 80% of the clients we work with, mm -hmm. is this excessive calcification. And the magnesium, even though again it's it's twice what it's supposed to be, relative to calcium, it's not enough. And that so, calcium figure um, influenced by someone who has osteoporosis or something? It, that's one of the factors that, that would, would play into it. Uh -huh. uh, but but there, this number, this profile that you see there is a very common profile in our office. So it's just to point out that there are different types. And then we have a sheet here of the richest sources of magnesium in the diet. And what's fascinating about this is if you look at any of the articles that are published in the current literature, the first thing they tell you to do is to go out and get leafy greens. You gotta get those greens. And if you look at that chart, what you'll see is that that leafy greens are probably the third best source of, mm. of magnesium after nuts and whole grains. Mm. And what's, what's very interesting about leafy greens is the reason why they're pushing leafy greens is they're very rich in calcium. Mm. And so they just never miss an opportunity to push mm. calcium into our body. But you can see Look at the sources of nuts, whole grains, beans and legumes, then it's vegetables, and then fruits. And again, very often in, a, in an article, they'll talk about fruit being a rich source of magnesium. What? Fruit? It's, no, it's not. It's not even close to being a rich source. Um, and if you really want to load up on, on uh, magnesium, have a pound of curry powder. <laughs> it's it's twelve hundred milligrams of of, uh, of of magnesium. I don't think you could stomach it, but yeah. it's a very rich source. So when you think about when you think about magnesium, try to keep this picture in mind. You see the whole grains and nuts mm -hmm. and seeds mm -hmm. and legumes, and you only see a little bit of greens. That's the way. That's where you need to look. Now, there are other forms of, of magnesium. Um, the magnesium citrate that, that you were looking for, the calm, that's, that's calm. Magnesium chloride that we are, are using here with the foot baths, that is magnesium oil. And then another popular one that a lot of people know about is Epsom salts, and that's magnesium sulfate. Molly, I had a question about that with the Epsom salts, you know, on that. When you got the big jug at sure. the uh, uh, CVS or whatever for soaking in, there's like like a warning about diabetics using it. Have you seen it on there? Mm -hmm. It's so weird. Mm -hmm. I'm going to bring it in tomorrow to show yeah, you. I, sure. I hadn't even read the thing, and then there was something about diabetes and, you know, caution. and. I don't know what the caution because I've I've read over 50 articles now, and easily... 25% of them about diabetes. Yeah. I've never seen any caution. Yeah, I'm going to bring it in because it was so strange. I thought, yeah. what is that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. 
um, maybe they don't want you to know it's a natural way to solve. Well, there you go. That's what I was wondering. <laughs> Whatever you do, don't use this. Yes, yeah. please. Yeah. We want to keep you in suspense. We want to keep you. That's right. Um, we'll look at that. Okay. Epsom salts were were developed in the 1800s. Actually. It was the Epsom Springs in England that were discovered in the 1600s. They didn't know what it was until the 1800s, but it's the Epsom Springs. As a child, I was often given an Epsom salt bath. But as I got older and used it, it caused me, my feet to swell because of the, 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 the um, salt or, or what. what I'm not sure what that would be. You're not okay. No. That, huh. Just, okay. Maybe that was an interaction with some medications or something. Because when you were younger, you weren't on anything. No, no. Because no. usually what would happen is magnesium would go up, sodium would come down. Yeah, and, that and would, so there shouldn't be There that. shouldn't be the... Yeah. We had Epsom salts, but I don't remember what before my mother had the weirdest kinds the, of... It was food. also used as a laxative. I don't think that was it. She oh, was big on tea enemas was her. Oh, oh. oh, we had so many tea enemas. I couldn't drink tea for <laughs> oh, a while. We, we had tea enemas. Oh, it was horrible. Yes. I can't even have And we could wow. never go to school till we'd done our morning work. <laughs> and she would never use the word bowel movement. No. <laughs> I mean, it was so ridiculous. And if we, if we had a cold or something, we had mustard plasters. Yes. Yeah. 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 More. And that, and what your mom did for you was probably ten times better than what you. Yeah. <laughs> but, but what I did, I never gave my children a TM. <laughs> oh, that I'm sure. Yeah. So you'd, you'd look at this chart, and you'd say, well, we should be using magnesium oxide. That's the that's the one to go to, and that's in fact what a lot of supplement companies use for their supplements. It's the least absorbable form of magnesium you can get. Mm. The most absorbable forms are. Magnesium chloride and magnesium sulfate. So, uh, this is this is your friendly neighborhood supplement companies deep at work trying to use these forms, which are very hard to, to digest and assimilate, and avoiding these. But this is area that, that we're focusing on. Um, there are many different ways. Hands down, the most powerful way to get magnesium back into your body is through IV. It, there's, you know, all sorts of... I love my foot soap, I believe. Love it. Foot soaps are very popular. And the bottom of your feet, it's very porous skin. The, the minerals do, in fact, get uh, soaked up very, very effectively. Obviously, tub soaks. Uh, direct application to oil, oils, and then, of course, oil. Part of the reason for these two that we are particularly intrigued by is that there isn't enough downtime in people's lives. And so asking someone to do a foot soak or a tub soak calms you down. Yes. And just by calming you down, it allows you to stop the magnesium leak and then allow your body to take even more. I want to ask you, maybe stupid, but does the foot soak and the, or the tub soak, does that cause Toxins to release and come out of that part of your body. Well, we we do work with with foot soaks here that are is an ionic uh, technique to bring toxins out. But yes, you are going to get some toxins out through uh, a foot soak just mm -hmm. because of the nature of the, yep. the exchange that's taking right. place. But I don't think it's going to be as but significant as it would be with the, the form that we use yep. here. Yep. How do we correct this? What, what we're recommending is a program that's, that's six days a week, you know, three to four weeks long, and that's a foot soak. And, um, and then after you've, you've been through that program, yeah. doing it two to three times per week as maintenance, and then putting the, the oil or the, um, the gel uh, is another form. Yeah. The gel is, has 40% of the strength of the oil. So it just allows you to have a, a yep. much milder form of it. Um, Where do you find that? To the whole body? You can. Um, you can also yeah. use it on your hair. You can mix it in with your shampoo. Oh, okay. and it helps to put the minerals back that oh. you lose in the aging process. 
with the it's, exception again, back to the people with kidney disease, you can put them aside. Ninety-nine point seven percent of the population can't get too much magnesium. Your your kidneys will excrete what you don't need, or your bowels will excrete what you don't need. They've done studies where they've given people sixteen hundred milligrams a day, which is five times the, the recommended dose. Not an issue. The body just has this natural ability to assimilate it, and what it doesn't need, it lets go of. Uh, foot soaks with magnesium oil, one to two ounces, just enough water to cover the tops of your toes. Soak anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes, and then just discard the liquid. Uh, tub soaks, again, two to four scoops to a bath with the crystals. Wish I could get them to And then, again, soak 15 to 30 minutes. And then direct application with the oil or the gel. Use full strength of diluted, and it can be mixed with, as, as Liz was pointing out, shampoo, conditioner, oils, etc. And then the other... Um, oh, I... Oops. Could you go back to that, please? Sorry. What? And again, the method in our madness is we're introducing a calming process to go along with the, the, uh, the application itself. Dr. Mark Circus is an um, uh, acupuncturist um, who actually works out of Brazil. He's probably one of the foremost authorities on topical applications. And his experience is that it goes against the gale wind of medical science to ignore magnesium fluoride used transdermally in the treatment of any chronic or acute disorder, especially cancer. Uh, what is best for you, whatever you will actually do. Uh, Liz and I had an uh, interesting experience. Um, one of our clients uh, has two kids, and the younger, the younger child uh, just graduated from high school, getting ready to go to college next month. He was over at a friend's house, and there was, it wasn't as a result of a fight, but just a misunderstanding. And this client of our son got shot in the throat with a pellet gun. And the, the pellet stopped one millimeter from severing his spinal cord. And he was, you know, you can imagine the trauma to, the, to this young boy. And he was taken to a local hospital, emergency surgery, to, to try to repair the trachea and the esophagus. And they asked Liz to come and do a healing, which she did, and he responded very beautifully to the healing. And then we asked, you should be asking about his magnesium status. And they went, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. And so they did, and lo and behold, his magnesium status had dropped. And so they administered magnesium. This was on Sunday after, Sunday morning at 4 o'clock. They gave him magnesium chloride IV. Or no, excuse me, Saturday evening they administered. Starting at 4 o'clock Sunday morning, he woke up. He started texting his friends, started writing. And he hasn't stopped since. And they're, they're just amazed. And they, they couldn't believe that he would respond so favorably to this little innocent memory. Mm. Well, then we found a, a, a publication from Thorax Magazine, published in 1975, that was recommending any time someone comes in for surgery, they should have preoperative magnesium, magnesium while they're being operated on, and postoperative magnesium. Mm. But that was 40 years ago, so they don't do that anymore. So the, the key is, in any opportunity you have to either ingest it, or have the foot soak, or try to stem the leaks, the stressors that we talked about, uh, you will find that, that you will be better off for it. And so again, what we would encourage you to do is anything that you will actually do to stem that tide of magnesium loss will be to your benefit. So that's the end of the foot soak. Can you do that three times a day or just? No, once a day is enough. Yeah, okay. Once a day is enough. Because you can overdo it. Well, you know, 
I don't know that you can overdo it so much as um, I just think it would be a lot of routine to go through yeah. each day to do that. I mean, yeah. we're thrilled if we get clients to do it once a day. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't from a from a um, from a metabolic standpoint, I don't think that's going to be an issue. Yeah. But I right. just think from a practical okay. day, daily living standpoint, I think it would be a challenge. Yeah. Questions that you might have? Mm -hmm. Oh, I was going to ask, how much, are, how much is recommended of intake for magnesium? Well, the daily um, recommendations are, for women, would be around 400 milligrams per day. For men, it's a little, a little higher. Uh, it's about 500 milligrams. Mm -hmm. The reason why, for women, it's lower, then for menstruating women, it would be lower, because with the Pre prevalence or presence of estrogen, the body is much more efficient with the use of magnesium. Mm -hmm. Don't ask me why. Mm -hmm. Just the way it is. So it's following more, following more menopause, more. you should be eating what many, which is about 500 milligrams a day. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen some authors recommend as high as 900 milligrams. In, in Europe, a lot of the health agencies are encouraging, and in Canada, they're encouraging people eat upwards of 750 to 900 milligrams a day. Again, you can't get too much. But that is, those are the, the parameters. The, the U.S. is very conservative in the use of, of uh, supplements. So thank you very much. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Oh, really interesting. interesting.